Hello, and welcome back to Sonata She Wrote. This is part two of an analysis of Chopin's first ballade in G minor. So without further delay, let's get a little bit theoretical. In part one of this video, we covered the layout of the exposition, or at least the first rotation of the themes of this piece. So if you haven't seen that yet, go back and check it out. For this video, we'll start right at the beginning of the second rotation or the development. Finzamkeit vols obli, but this time we're circling the tonality of A, whether minor or major is not quite clear yet. The action is all unfolding over a dominant pedal. I've mentioned in several videos that the development doesn't have a layout strategy like expositions or recapitulations do, but this key is still an odd duck especially considering where we just were when the exposition ended, in E-flat major. We now find ourselves a tritone away. The tritone's reputation as a devilish interval is much overblown, but what's notable is that if you move around the circle of fifths, there is no key farther away from E-flat major than A major. You may also notice the dramatic gestures here, the melody struggling to reach the height of A major is an embodied recognition of the remoteness of this key. Tarasti labels this section as Isotopy 6, a transitional version of the primary theme which is not doing. The reason is that the dominant pedal, the E under everything, is keeping any attempt at action under its boot. We'll need another agent if we want to get out of this mess. this iteration of the secondary theme, we get a perfect authentic cadence in A major, or at least the spirit of one. This E in the bass has to carry over through the bar, but to my ear, it does. Tarasti's analysis in this section is one of my favorite aspects of his theory, that the music is lying. What was, in the exposition, a beautiful sotto voce is now puffed up and orchestral, rocketing upwards in octave scales away from the stability of the bass line. At first, the theme is beautiful and a relief from the dreary static waltz, but it begins to morph into an imposing reflection of itself, not quite doing, but appearing to do. The next section transitions us away from the secondary theme, a tempestuous mocking of the original closing theme. But where are we headed? Considering the drama of the exposition, if the development is over, it was quite brief. Thank you. 
We've started a new rotation. I've labeled it as a recap, and I do think it functions that way, but we're really getting into the deformative aspects of this piece now. In part one, I teased the book Sonata Fragments by Andrew Davis. Dr. Davis is the Dean of the College of Arts at the University of Houston, where I got my doctorate. And in his book, he posits that, and this is a huge oversimplification, so I encourage you to check into his book if you're interested, romantic composers may have viewed the sonata form as a kind of classical ruin, not unlike the modern day ruins of the Colosseum or the Parthenon, rather than as a complete structure. We have only fragments, a small piece of what was once a huge structure. The sonata form version of ruins could manifest in many ways, by only partial rotations of themes, or, as in the Chopin Ballade, with strange and atypical tonal layouts. Rather than getting a B-flat major second theme, we have a collapsed version of it in E-flat major. In terms of the whole structure, Rather than having a clear sonata type, we almost have a fusion between a type 3 sonata, the textbook, and a type 2 sonata, which is a sonata where the second rotation is partially developmental and partially a tonal recap. We of course did have a full developmental rotation in the ballade, but this third rotation is also somewhat developmental. We aren't in G minor, although the global 6 or E flat is a tonal option for the recap, it doesn't feel like that is what Chopin's doing here. You may also notice how often this theme flirts with C minor, and when it finally does open a caesura, we find ourselves not in G major or minor, but still in E flat. I think Dr. Davis's idea of sonata ruins, or sonata fragments, as he calls his book, is probably the most accurate way to discuss this piece. And before we set it aside, I'd like to bring one more of his ideas to your attention, the arabesque. The arabesque, along with the fragment, are ideas Dr. Davis has borrowed from the poet and literary critic Frederick Schlegel, whose life and death dates are very similar to Beethoven's if you want to place him in history. Davis's innovation here is the application of these ideas to romantic music, rather than just romantic poetry similar to Allman's adaptation of Fry's narrative archetypes to music. The arabesque is probably more familiar to us as a position in ballet, but a secondary definition is an extremely ornamented, even Baroque, variation of an idea. An ornamentation so complex and grotesque that it actually obscures the original subject. I believe this concept of the arabesque applies not necessarily to the sonata form of this entire ballade, but absolutely to this iteration of the primary theme that opens the third rotation. Tarasti considers this isotopy, number nine, to be a combination of the primary and secondary themes, which I'll admit to you that I don't really see or hear. But I do still love his continuation of the concept of musical lying in this piece. This theme isn't being, but attempting to appear to be. Tarasti leaves it at that, but in my mind, this theme is actually doing. What it is doing is lying about being. Sort of like skim milk, which is water that's lying about being milk. <laughs> Thank you. 
The arabesque continues through the transition, and even into the medial caesura and caesura fill of the recap, which opens up space for our secondary theme in, oh no, in E flat. Chopin cadences in this tonal area twice. The exposition of this piece may have been a fragment or ruined version of sonata form, but the recapitulation has more of the quality of Chopin's response to those ruins. Whereas the expository secondary theme cadenced almost accidentally, this is absolutely intentional and not ambiguous as the exposition was. Tarasti describes Isotopy 10, which consists of both the S and C themes as being, but he draws attention to these quintuplets in bars 170 to 172, noting that they are derived from the bardic opening and representative of a romantic idea of defeat, the kernel of which was internal rather than external. Thus, it appears to be being. In my opinion, this dovetails wonderfully with sonata theory. If you were merely a listener, and let's assume you were a listener without perfect pitch, you might not realize that this theme is in E flat major, but rather assume that it is in the sonata appropriate key of G major. It would be entirely up to the performer to convey the duplicity of Chopin's strategy. But hold on, what's this? The primary theme? In the tonic key? impotent by its own dominant pedal, and therefore not being, as it was in the development, and not have Chopin follow it with the secondary theme, is such a blow to the psyche. But what Chopin is doing here is even more clever. He interrupts what would be a very typical coda. Codas are often based on the material of the P theme, with none other than the introductory bard. We have left the reality of this tale, and the bard, now with wailing and gnashing of teeth, solidifies the tragedy we have just been made to experience. Note that this is in cut time, four being a trait of the intro, as well as the reoccurring Neapolitan chords, also curiously absent from the inner body of the sonata. And when we continue to the end of this, the unmistakable sound of a piano imitating a harp will reoccur. Tarasti labels this section as the solidification of the tragic ballade and notes the temporal shift. Of course, the time signature has changed as in the beginning, but we are also now removed from the narrative time of the piece, returned to the flow of time in reality with the bard.
once both violently furious and desperately miserable, the bard ends this tale with sound and fury. Tarasti notes that this isotopy, which for him includes only measure 251 onward as a coda, or the entry of the heart motif, as negating the secondary actor of this drama. The melodic material of the waltz is heard not with sentimentality in the character of the Vols Obli, but rather as a battle cry. The secondary theme, our agent of change, was powerless to rework reality. My parting thoughts to you about the form of this piece, and whether it is or isn't in sonata form, are not going to shake anyone's reality. If we hold to a strict definition of sonata form, we have to say no. This piece simply does not follow the tonal trajectory we expect of a sonata. But what sonata theory allows us is the ability to view this form as being in dialogue with sonata form. Although not a sonata, the theory gives us the tools to analyze this piece as a version of sonata form, which is deformed and ornamented almost beyond recognition, an arabesque of a sonata, and find enhanced meaning in the music itself. I hope you enjoyed this journey through Chopin's G minor ballade, and if you want to fight me about sonata form or sonata theory, and my sheer audacity at even using the theory to analyze this piece, go ahead and leave me a comment below.